be reading from the Gospel of John, and he'll be reading from verse 18 all the way to verse 27. Twelve. <laughs> from chapter 18, verse 12. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I just wanted to, I was going to throw out a challenge, but this place is crowded this morning. I was going to say, if you have a friend or somebody you know who hasn't been in a long time, invite them and let's have to get more chairs next time. But we got a big crowd this morning, so, you know, I, I get nervous reading in front of people. <laughs> All right, we'll read now. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Anas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since the disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the wor world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, for all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard the, what I have said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. <clears throat> one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Let us pray. God, thank you for this word. Uh, let the knowledge come from Pastor Ray today to enlighten us about this world and uh, the world that when Christ lived and where he came and died for our sins by his grace. And through his grace, we were saved. And I just thank you for today is Communion Sunday, and we'll remember that at the end of this service. And I just bless Pastor Ray as he brings us the word. In Christ's name, amen. Well, thank you, Sheldon. <clears throat> I titled this morning's message, Attacks. It seems this summer is a time for bug attacks. The other day we had an ant attack in the bedroom. I, I couldn't figure out what they were after. I mean, there's no food in that room, and there they were with their line of uh, soldiers going through and they actually got on our bedspread because it was laying on this this little uh, couchy thing and they were all over and in the morning we had all these ants and now I think that the ants out in our area are smarter than the ones at our <laughs> North Lakeport because because I just mess with them a little bit and then they all go home they disappear uh, over there, they just keep on, you know, keep on going. And uh, they're a lot like the Brazilian ants. They're real smart. Uh, you know, but, but uh, uh, there's also been other attacks that have happened at our new place. Um, we have squirrels. And they keep attacking our stuff. And we have rabbits. And they ate all our lettuce. And the deer came in and they ate all our tomato plants. Uh, and we also had uh, other bugs that were 
chewing and munching on our vegetables. So we gave up on the vegetables. Uh, raccoons came in the yard. Uh, there, the turkeys, now I haven't seen them inside the yard, but I've been told that they fly in and fly out, so I might not necessarily see them. Uh, but uh, last night I heard uh, coyotes and I'd seen some tracks around uh, and I thought, you know, they're, they're out there. They're out to get us. <laughs> last week I saw a bobcat walking up the road, you know, and I thought, man, I, I didn't see all this wildlife over at, over at the, it was tame over there, you know, <laughs> at our old house. It was, it was something. Uh, well, you know, uh, with all the bugs and critters and these vicious attacks, uh, I've, I've realized that uh, it's like the enemy, uh, Satan, uh, who is constantly bugging us. It, play on words, get that right. He keeps bugging. Uh, you know, we are always under attack. Uh, our spiritual life is always under attack. I, I don't know if you realize that, when we're coasting along, then we are vulnerable. And let's not be vulnerable. Let's talk about that this morning. Because that's what happened to Peter. Peter got into a mode and he began to, uh, to fall into the, the, the denial. The, the, you know, he denied Jesus. Of all times, to deny Jesus was when Jesus was arrested and put in front of the religious leaders. Of all times, uh, Peter was under attack. And let's talk about these attacks. And I think what we, what, what we need to think about is that we should expect attacks. Uh, we, we sometimes think that we're, we're not vulnerable but we are, and, and Peter definitely was vulnerable. After the betrayal of, of Judas Iscariot, right, Jesus was arrested and bound, and so in verse 12, it's almost a recap of the previous passage, verses 1 through 11, which we talked about last week. It says, The detachment of troops and the captain of the officers and the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Now, it's interesting here that what we find is that they, they, they tied Jesus up. I mean, today, in, today they'd put handcuffs on him, right, uh, and lead him out. Uh, and uh, this, this is, you know, as if Jesus needed to be bound because he willingly gave himself to the sacrifice, Right. Uh, he willingly went to the cross. In fact, when they came looking for him, as we talked about last week, he says, who are you seeking? That's me. And, uh, and, and of course, we saw the power of God even in that arrest. And they take Jesus and bind him and take him off. But in the first place they took him was not to Pilate. Uh, they took him to a man by the name of Annas, his house. And let's look at what it says here in verse 13. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now something that you need to know about Annas is that Annas was previously the high priest. So he's a high priest, and he was succeeded by his son-in-law Caiaphas. Now, it's interesting that in those days, the, the high priest was not appointed for life. It wasn't like the Jews would appoint the high priest and the, and the high priest's lineage. It was all inherited. And Annas was not from the high priestly lineage. And yet, he was appointed as the high priest and his sons succeeded him, but in this case, Caiaphas was his son-in-law, became appointed by the Romans to be the high priest. And, and uh, Caiaphas 
became the new high priest and he reigned or led the people of Israel for 18 years, which was the longest period that any, any and during that era had led the people. But Annas fell out of favor with the Jews and that's, or the, the Romans, and that's why Caiaphas was appointed in his place. So it's very interesting that they would take him to Annas' house, not Caiaphas. And later what we'll find is that they referred to Annas as the high priest because he's still alive, right? And so, so there's this, this uh, power going on between Ca uh, uh, Caiaphas and, and uh, Annas. And, and uh, yet they were working together, but yet Jesus was taken first to Annas' house. And you kind of see that they... That they still considered Annas to be the high priest, even though Caiaphas was appointed as the high priest. So John reminded his readers what Caiaphas had said earlier, and it says in verse 14, Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man, that one man should die for the people. And, uh, and so Annas, uh, sorry, so Caiaphas was the one who actually prophesied that Jesus would die. And here Jesus is, right, being arrested and is at Annas' house first. Now, this is clearly an illegal, uh, an illegal trial that's taking place for a couple of different reasons. Number one is that it was performed at night. So they picked up Jesus right in the middle of the night. It was late on uh, that uh, Thursday night, Passover evening. And he and Jesus and his disciples had gone out from the Passover meal, had gone across the Kidron Valley up into the Mount of Olives. Jesus had time there to, to go and pray in the garden the disciples were tired and started to fall asleep while he told them to, to watch and wait. And so it was getting pretty late. And then here comes this company of men to arrest Jesus. And, and so they take him to Annas' house. And, and, no, and none of these trials were supposed to take place at night. And so this particular trial was a preliminary trial, so to speak, and yet it was illegal in, even in, by Jewish standards. And so here, uh, Annas and Caiaphas and all those men are in the wrong uh, when they even uh, arrested Jesus. And we learn in verse 15, here's Peter coming to, uh, to see what's going on, to see the the process, and it's, it's clear from this text only, the other, the other Gospels don't mention this at all. They always talk about Peter as, as, as if Peter just showed up by himself. But there's another disciple there as well. And verse 15 shows us that there is someone else, another disciple, that's involved and it says in Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple now that disciple was known to the high priest and when Jesus went into the court and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest so there's a lot of speculation that's been that's been put into who that other disciple was uh, there's they, they've talked about, uh, you know, maybe it was Nicodemus, maybe it was uh, uh, some other, you know, high uh, council member or something like that, a disciple, but not one of the 12. But this is actually, I believe, that this is John, who is the one who is known to the high priest. John, who's writing this, never names himself in the gospel. He always refers to himself as the, the disciple whom Jesus loved or the other disciple 
you know, when Peter and John were running towards the, the, sorry, Peter and the other disciple were running towards the, the tomb, the empty tomb, and the other disciple outran Peter, right? So, so we know that John refers to himself as the other disciple pretty, pretty frequently in his book. And so here, it's this other disciple that's there. Now, some people think about uh, John. They go, how could a fisherman be known to the high priest? Well, there's lots of ways that he could be known to the high priest. And one way would be that he and his father, Zebedee, were fishermen. They were professional fishermen. And they were the ones who provided food, fish, for the high priest and all that. They, they could have been the ones who did that. In fact, there are some ancient writings that allude or even say, come out and say that, that uh, John's family was involved with bringing food, uh, fish specifically, to the high priest, providing the, the fish for them. And so, so it's quite easily uh, connected that John was known to the high priest. And of course, the, the text tells us that whoever this disciple was, was, was known. And so they just let him in, right? Uh, and so he, is, uh, he, he has no issue coming in. They, they probably already know that he's connected with Jesus. Say, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Uh, but Peter is left outside. And I might ask myself, well, why was Peter outside if he came with the other disciple? And the answer really is a speculation, but what I, I would, I kind of visualize this, and let me read the verse before I speculate, speculate too much. It says, but Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. And, and I kind of visualize this, that here's Peter and John, the other disciple, and they arrive, and John, John introduces them, so I'm here, you know, and Peter just kind of freezes. He's standing at the door, I don't know if I should go in. You kind of see that, right? There's this hesitation, and so he's still outside. He didn't just come right on in, when John, John wouldn't have just barged in, there would have been somebody who let him in, right? And, and so there was, there was, I think there was a hesitation. And Peter's just standing outside, and John realizes, or this other disciple realizes, look, there, he's still outside. We can't just leave Peter out there. And so he uh, gets the attendant and says, can you let him in? Uh, there's my friend out there. Can you bring him in? But it's interesting, though, uh, that this exchange takes place right after, uh, as this, this woman is letting uh, Peter in. And this is where Peter is caught off guard. In verse 17, this is the attack, and this is where Peter makes his first mistake. Verse 17, it says this, then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. So here is the, the attack, right? The question that she asks is, a, is almost like one of those questions the affirm, to affirm a no answer. It's, it's one of those kind of things where it's really easy to just say, No, no. Because she's expecting a no answer from him. The way she phrased it is, you're not one of his disciples, are you? No, of course not, right? It's, it's like, well, yes. I mean, it was, it's kind of this opposite. The expectation is that he's not. And then to, to go against that would be going flowing the opposite direction. Now, P, now, John is probably within earshot and hears this exchange. Can you imagine what's going through John's 
head at that very moment. He's there seeing this whole thing take place and Peter's denying Jesus and I think that it must have disappointed uh, John. I, I, and, and I think that what happened here is that Peter was taken off guard. He didn't expect a question. They, he just expected that they would just let him in. But here's the, here's the question. You're put on the spot and you have a choice. Do you answer correctly? Do you say, yes, I am a follower of Jesus? Or you just kind of brush it under the carpet and say, well, no. Or just avoid the question altogether. Have you ever been put in a, in a situation where we are called upon to, uh, to uh, identify who, who we are, right, in a sense, and who we're associated with, and, and where there's a hesitation that might take place in our brain that just says, I don't know if I should tell this person I'm a Christian or not. Or you just, you're open about it. And yep, I'm a Christian, you know. I'm not ashamed to be a Christian. But sometimes the silence is just as, is almost the same or is the same as a denial. Um, and I think that this is what happened to Peter. He was put on the spot and he just kind of went with the flow. And I really think that Peter never expected that anything else would come of it. It was just this servant lady, girl, lets him in, asks him the question, he says no, and then it's all over. And then you just kind of go, go along and nobody's going to say anything. It's just, we're done. But that's not what happened, right? As we know the story, it, it goes on from there. Now, now we have Peter admitted to the courtyard. And verse 18, we see him comfortable. Look at what it says here in verse 18. Now the servants said, the servants and the officers who had made the fire of coal stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. So you can just kind of see the scene, right? There's, there's a fire, Peter's kind of got comfortable, he got in, he's incognito, it's dark, uh, you know, just sitting around a campfire, or standing around a campfire, and it seems that he's just sort of gotten comfortable with himself, right? And, uh, and I think of it like this, that Peter's considering himself loyal to Jesus because he's there, but he's just sort of loyal. Have you ever thought about that? I'm just sort of loyal, right? I'm loyal when it's convenient, right? When I'm with the the other 11, I can be real bold. You know, Jesus is standing there and uh, we can be bold, but we're by ourselves. And Peter is now a little bit timid. Uh, and we don't think of Peter as being timid, do we? We think of him as being outspoken, bold, uh, strong. But here's a moment of weakness. He's tired. Uh, he's been through a lot that, that evening. Right? Jesus has told him so much. His head is full. He gets, then Jesus is arrested and everything that he thought is dashed to pieces. Jesus is arrested. What is going on? He goes there to, to find out what's happening and he gets confronted. So you can just see how this could happen. And it could easily happen to any one of us if we're not on guard. And the story continues. I'm going to skip over to verse 25 because we want to talk about Peter first and this attack. And in verse 25, it says, I'll come back to the other verses in a minute. But now it says, Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore, they said to him, Are you not also one of his disciples? Are you? 
And he denied it and said, I am not. Now, he's already, he's already been caught in a lie, right? And so the lie is perpetuated. It's, it's already, he's already made the statement. He's already committed himself to the no answer. And now he's being confronted again in the hearing of all. He's already said it. They probably already heard it anyway. And so to say, well, actually, I'm one of his disciples. I mean, can you, right? He's, he's, in, he's in the moment. He's already been attacked. And now he's attacked again. And what is he going to do? So he says, I am not. And, the, and then the third time he gets the treatment again because they don't believe him. Why are you here? You're just a stranger. You're a Galilean. We can tell by your accent. Here you are, warming yourself at the fire. We know that Jesus' disciples are Galilean. And actually, you were recognized. So what's the problem, right? So here in verse 26 and 27, it says, One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of... Get this. A relative of him who, whose ear Peter had cut off said, did I not see you in the garden with him? I mean, really, right? Yeah, it was me. <laughs> no, he says, and, immediate, and he, then he denied again, and immediately the rooster crowed. In fact, another passage actually says that he, 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 he called down curses. Ah. You know, it's like, no way, you know, and, he, and you know, uh, I mean, can you, wow, and, and Jesus is right there, hearing all this, John is right there, hearing all this, and Peter's cursing, and, and denying knowing Jesus, all this. And then the rooster crowed. Whenever I hear the roosters crow out there, I, always, I think about Peter. And so Peter is told in Luke, and actually all three of the other Gospels tell us his reaction. I just chose the Luke passage, 2262. It says, so Peter went out and wept bitterly. Peter realized that Jesus was right. Jesus had told him that before the rooster would crow, that very night, he says, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And bing, just like that, the rooster crows, what have I done? Just like that. There's Peter, weeping bitterly. When I was nine, <clears throat> I had a friend who was a couple years older than me. Uh, that friendship lasted a, quite a number of years, but uh, during that time, uh, he came to know Jesus as his, as his Savior. And uh, because of him, uh, his mother came to know the Lord. His brother, his two sisters, and eventually the father made a profession of faith. I'm not real sure that the father actually is saved, but he, at least he made a profession of, of faith. And it was, it was an incredible thing that it was over those years that, that the whole family came to know Jesus. But I tell you this because there was an incident that happened. Uh, we, we left Brazil. I was about 10. So we left Brazil and uh, we went back on furlough to the U.S. And the furlough lasts about a year. And then we go back. And uh, so we were gone a year. And when I came back, 
uh, to the area. We weren't living in the same house, so it was a little bit, our contact with them a little different, but I still had contact with my friend. And what happened was someone else told me that my friend not only denied Jesus to them, said, I don't know Jesus, and had also, uh, you know, made up some other lies about, you know, because he used to play with me, and we, we like those action figures, and in Brazil, they're called bonecos, which is dolls, boy dolls, and we don't play with boy dolls, right? We're, we're you know, and so I was 11, he would have been 13. You don't play with dolls, right? Even if they are action figures, right? G.I. Joe. And, and uh, I had one that was kind of like a 007. And we just loved that. You know, I had an Indian and I had a cowboy, you know. We played, we played with all these different things. Well, he, he denied Jesus. And I didn't care if he denied playing with the dolls. But I cared about that he denied that he knew Jesus. And I think that that was a turning point for him. Because our relationship wasn't that great after that. I mean, we tried. Uh, and he lived in a different, t a different part of town, uh, and it was hard to con connect with them. And, and there was the transportation. You know, you're thir 11, 12 years old. You know, you, you can't drive or anything. So, so that... So late, years later, um, I caught up with them, and I was really disappointed with how his life was going. I mean, I was really, I was sad because he wasn't very friendly. You know, he hadn't seen me in like ages. And here we were just kind of like strangers. And I really think that it was because of his lack of spine when it came to his other friends who confronted him about Jesus. But the good news is, is that a few years back, I guess it was maybe like eight years ago, I just started thinking about him, and I just, I was able to use social media, and I found him. And I connected up with them, and... His sister, and it was, it was his older sister was the one that I found first. And his sister had gone on mission trips and everything. She's still on fire for the Lord. And she asked me to write a letter for my friend to, to, uh, to help him on his spiritual journey. And he was going to a men's event and he was getting back on track with the Lord. So I'm 62. So back when that happened, it was maybe five, seven years ago, he would have been maybe 57-ish, uh, getting back on track with the Lord. But you know what happens when we deny Jesus? I think it takes us down a path that is pretty dangerous. A path that is difficult to come back from. And I think it was the support of his sister and some others that were really encouraging him to get back on track for the Lord. And I think that he's still following Jesus. I, I, his, his Facebook post, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I can't, I can't tell. But I think that sometimes we're sort of loyal to Jesus instead of all in. I think that often we are followers of Jesus when it's convenient. We're followers of Jesus when it's, when we've got others around us, you know. You go in a group and you can just say, yeah. I'm, I'm one. Uh, but when you're alone, it's harder. 
Are we ashamed of our association with Jesus? Are we secret agent Christians? I don't think that there's such a thing as a secret agent Christian. I think we're either all in or we're not in. I don't think there's some somewhere in between. I remember years ago, there was a girl in our, in our uh, youth group, and she said, I kind of believe. I said, you can't kind of believe in Jesus. And that was the last time we saw her. Because I, can, I, I told her, you got to make a choice. You're either following him or not. I'm kind of, no, it's not good enough. She never came back to youth group. I think that sometimes we think that our relationship with Jesus is private. That's just between me and him. It's not private. I think that's what John was trying, or what Peter was trying to do, keep his relationship with Jesus Jesus private. There's no such thing as a private relationship with Jesus. I think think that uh, the modern church has kind of done a disservice because we have this thing where we say we put our trust in Jesus as our personal Savior. Yes, that's true, but it's not just a personal as in private. And I think people take it that way and they go, oh, it's just between me and God. It's personal. But it's much more than that. We're, we're to live our relationship out out loud <laughs> as I think there was a song uh, well there was a song some years back Steve, Stephen Curtis Chapman wrote it's, it was called Live Out Loud and, and the, the, the refrain was every corner of creation is a living declaration come join the song we were made to sing every corner of creation is a living declaration. Come and join the song. We are made to sing. Everybody get out loud. Because we are here to share what Jesus has done in our life. He's changed our life. And we are here as living proof that our heart can be changed. Look what what it says in Matthew chapter 5. Familiar passage uh, to most of you probably, but it says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, we're not to be silent, we're not to be covered up, we're not to be hidden, we're to shine the light of Jesus for the world to see. And how do we shine? Well, we live right, but we also do the good works so that people will see the good works and that they will glorify God in heaven. Do your actions match what you say? Many believe that they can live however they want and do whatever they want and still identify with Christ. That is a lie. We're not free to do whatever we want whenever we want because we are bought with a price. We belong to Jesus That is if he bought you. I like to think of this. Obedience is not optional. If you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus said in John 14, 15. Jesus doesn't want just part of you. He wants all of you. He doesn't want sort of followers. He wants full-on committed followers. But 
the good thing is if somehow we've fallen short, there's forgiveness. Just like Peter, John 21, we'll get to it eventually, but Jesus restored Peter, and Peter was a changed man after that. Instead of succumbing to the attacks, we need to put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You don't have time to talk about the armor, but go to Ephesians chapter 6 and look at those pieces of armor that we all need. The thing is, is that we can't be taken by surprise. And that's what happened to Peter. He was taken by surprise. You're not one of his disciples, are you? Peter could have easily said, well, yeah. And so? But he said, no, I am not. How's your relationship with Jesus? Are you all in? Jesus was attacked too. Meanwhile, as all this is going on, Peter's denying Jesus. Jesus is under attack. They hadn't accused him of anything, but were trying to get Jesus to incriminate himself. That's the second thing that they did wrong. The first thing was that they held an illegal trial at night before daybreak that was against Jewish law. And second of all, they had no, nothing that they actually arrested him for something that he actually did. They just kept trying to get him to incriminate himself. In fact, here is, is uh, in verse 19, we see that coming out. It says, and the high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. And Jesus' answer was to look at what all he had already said in verse 19. 20 it says Jesus answered him I spoke openly to the world I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always met and in secret I have said nothing they already knew what Jesus stood for but they were trying to get him to say something that they could use against him even though Jesus had repeatedly proved that he was the Christ, they still refused to believe it. And they wanted him to actually say the words, I am the Christ. So they go, aha! And he refused to fall into their trap. Jesus wanted them to weigh the evidence and come to their own conclusion. They had already seen all the evidence, all the proof, even right at the arrest, there was the Malchus's ear being cut off and Jesus healing that, the, the soldiers all falling over, all this taking place just on that very night. And Jesus says, why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. In other words, produce witnesses. And they had none. Instead of attacking what he said and attacking what he did, they attacked the person. Have you ever been, been attacked? You know, your character attacked by someone. They don't attack everything else. They attack you personally. And that's what they did to Jesus here in verse uh, 22. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, right? This is a slap in the face, saying, do you answer the high priest like that? It wasn't really a question, and Jesus answered it. Check out the evidence. Ask the people who were there. That was an appropriate response. And of course, Jesus didn't deserve a slap on the face in verse 23. And Jesus answered him, If I had spoken evil, bear witness of the evil, but if well, why do you strike me? And at this point, Annas finished with Jesus, ready to send him to Caiaphas, the actual high priest at the time. Verse 24. 
Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Have you ever noticed that no one attacks Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, or any other religion? They're always attacking Jesus. Jesus is the one that they use as a swear word. Jesus is the one that you are not allowed to be associated with. You can come up to somebody and say, hey, I'm a Buddhist, and nobody would say anything. Oh, good for you. Right? I'm a Christian. Whoa. Wait a minute. You're a weirdo. That's exactly what happens. But here, Jesus is being attacked. And Jesus is on trial. Not for something that he did or something that he said, but for who he is. Because Jesus is God and Jesus came down to earth in order to pay the penalty for our sin. And Jesus told his disciples that they would attack him and they would attack his followers. So be ready. John 15 18 and 19. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of, of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, I ch I, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So don't be surprised that people hate us. Don't try to be their friend. Don't try to to uh, um, smooth over, hide who you are, hide your affiliation with Jesus just to make them happy. It'll just make you miserable. Peter was so bold at his sermon at Pentecost and he pulled no punches. Before he was like, no, I don't know Jesus. But look at what he said to the crowd on the day of Pentecost. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death, whom God raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. You put him on the cross. You are responsible for his death. And it's true. It's because of our sin that Jesus went to the cross. We are responsible for his death. And Peter accused them of putting Jesus to death. He was not hiding behind a campfire or a closed door. But he also showed them that they needed Jesus' forgiveness. Look at what he says in verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins that you shall Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The disciples were told to be silent, not to speak about Jesus. And so this is what they said in verse 28, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. And Peter and the other disciples said this, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. For God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging him on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior 
to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins and that we are his witness and these of these things and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. The boldness of Peter is clear. Jesus was attacked, but now we too can be bold in sharing Jesus with the world. Satan would love to shut you up. But don't let Satan shut you up. Don't let Satan attack you and keep you from identifying with Jesus. But here's the big question. Do you know Jesus? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus alone for your salvation? If not, repent of your sin and trust Jesus alone for your salvation. As believers, we're, we should expect attacks because Jesus was attacked. But there's hope. We are going to be uh, taken care of by Jesus. We're on his side. And he is there for us all the time. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to, to just encourage your people to stand firm even though there's going to be attacks, if there haven't been already, Lord, even if they're subtle, help us to stand firm and be bold in our relationship with you. Be bold in our witness. Lord, help us to, uh, to know when to speak. And Lord, help us to, to know what to say. And Lord, we don't want to be like Peter. Uh, we want to... Uh, before, uh, we want to be like him afterward, uh, forgiven and bold. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, hopefully you had a chance to get one of the little cups. Uh, if you didn't grab one of those, uh, sneak back to the back real quick and grab one. It's on that back table. Uh, and uh, you'll, need, you'll need your... Uh, communion cup right right now but i wanted to transition over to uh our communion and and what we're we're we you know jesus went to the cross right uh, and uh and and his it's all about what he did on the cross his body that was broken his blood that was shed because without the shedding of blood there is no remission or forgiveness of sin so we need to remember why jesus went to the cross As we've been studying the book of john we're we're headed towards the cross i mean everything about the book of john is who jesus is and where he's going to the cross and it's all about what he did on the cross for us and so in first corinthians chapter 11 uh, Paul gives instructions to the Corinthians because they, were, they weren't practicing the communion, the Lord's table, in a right way. And we want to do it right, so we want to have an opportunity for you to confess any and confess sins because the table is for believers. Those that have trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, this is the... Uh, the reason why we celebrate this is because we have done that and we, have, we believe that Jesus paid for our sin with his blood. And so in verse, in verse 27 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, look, make sure you're right with God first. And he says this, therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and let him also then and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For whoever eats and 
and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So I'm just going to give you a moment to just bow your head in silent prayer, confess any unconfessed sins, especially those of, of omission, right, where you haven't been faithful in sharing Jesus and you've just kept your rela relationship quiet. Uh, but also, if you're harboring any sin in your life, uh, please confess it now. Lord, you know that we are weak and frail and, and Lord, we know that we need your strength. Uh, we, we don't want to be like Peter, uh, but Lord, help us to be strong in our relationship with you and confident and bold. But Lord, as we fail, we sin and we know that our sin is despicable in your sight. However small it may seem to the world, it's still large in your eyes. Lord, we bring these sins to you and we confess them freely. And we know that there's forgiveness. And Lord, as we come to the bread, Lord, we thank you for it and we thank you that it represents your body that was broken for us. Thank you that that you've given us this visual reminder of what occurred 2,000 years ago. And we thank you for your willingness to go to the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. You could take the wafer off the top of your cup and hold it for a moment. I want you to think about, you know, these little wafers are complete. They're a little circle, but I'm going to break one as a reminder of Jesus' broken body. And it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread together. And the cup represents Jesus' blood that was shed for us. Without the broken body, the blood would not flow. The blood flowed freely. And it flowed in order to pay for our sin. Lord, thank you so much for this cup, this reminder of your blood. I thank you that you have given us these, this ordinance to, to be reminded of your death on a regular basis. And Lord, we, we rehearse this every week in our hearts and, and in our speech, but yet every month we have the visual, a reminder of your blood that was shed for us. And as we take this cup together, we are declaring as a unit, as a congregation, that we agree that your, your blood paid in full for our sin. And we claim Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And Lord, we thank you for what that sacrifice that you, that you did so long ago that is current today for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying... This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, 
You proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's drink the cup together. Before I close the service, I just wanted to remind you on the very, very back table under the window, there's an offering plate there. And if you have uh, some funds you'd like to give towards our deacon fund, our benevolence offering, uh, please put it there, not in the offering box, uh, so that they can re remain separate. Uh, and then also, if you have a knowledge of anyone in our church that has a financial need that our, our deacons can meet, please let us know. Um, and uh, uh, we would be happy to help uh, those that are in need. And so, uh, so please keep that in mind as well. So uh, let, me, let me dismiss us. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to come together this morning. And we give you praise and honor and glory. Thank you for loving us and caring for us, bringing us together this morning. And I pray that your name would be glorified in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.